So this is a webinar, or a, actually, it's actually a training class on behavior-driven development. I'm going to teach this just as if I was teaching a behavior-driven dri development class. So there will be some exercises we're going to do. I'm going to ask you to, to write some things and share some things. So I hope you're ready to um, participate and uh, have some fun and learn some interesting things. So first of all, let's do a quick introduction. My name is Nick Kramer. I am um, an agile trainer and coach here with uh, WebAge. And um, I, uh, here's my email address. You can always welcome to email me. And here's my Skype account if you want to um, Skype me and, and we can chat if you have any questions about things in the future. So here's what we're gonna be covering um, through this class, kind of these high level topics. We are going to last, the session will last for three hours. I am going to take a few breaks, probably three or, or so 10 minute breaks throughout the class. Um, and in those breaks, I might ask you to do some quick exercises. Um, so I'm not sure. The first thing I'd like to do is for everybody to take out a full eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper. And I'd like to um, play a requirements game and I'm gonna have you draw a picture. All right, so here's what we're gonna do. I'm going to list off these requirements that are listed here on the screen. And then I'm gonna give you a chance to ask me additional requirement questions that you might have. And then I'm gonna have you draw the picture and then we're gonna have a conversation about it. Okay, so here are your requirements. The first thing to do is take out a full sheet of paper and fold the paper in half. Item number two or requirement number two, draw a square. Number three, in the left-hand corner, draw a circle. Number four, at the top of the page, draw a triangle. Number five, draw a straight line on the left and right side of the square. And then finally, number six, I'd like you to draw a rectangle in the square. All right, so does anybody have any additional requirements? All right, you gotta put them in the, you can either put them in the chat or you can just um, interrupt me, that's fine. So the first one is fold the paper long or on the short axis. You are going to fold the paper on the short axis. And the fold will then be at the top of the page. The square should be in the, the question is where to draw the square. The square will be in the middle of the half piece of paper. Additional questions? How large should the square be? The square is a two inch square. Are the lines horizontal or vertical in number five? The, okay, I'll give you the requirement here. The, the, the requirement is that you should, the line should start on the left-hand side of the page and end on the left-hand side of the square and start on the right-hand side of the page and end on the right-hand side of the square. If that makes any sense. The lines are horizontal and it's, Yes, they're horizontal. The circle is a one inch diameter circle. The rectangle is one half inch wide by three quarters of an inch high.
is the line linked to the bottom or top of the square. The line touches the square and it touches it one, one quarter inch from the bottom of the square. So it does link it, it's a, it links uh, a quarter inch from the bottom of the square. The circle is in the upper left hand corner. Which side of the page paper is the circle on? I'm sorry, it's on the front side. All the all the uh, shapes are on the front side of the paper with the fold at the top. All right. Any additional questions? All right. And now over oh, the size of the triangle. Okay, the triangle is a two inch equilateral triangle with the point pointing up. It touches the top of the square. Uh, where's the triangle related to the square? It touches the top of the square. They actually share the base of the triangle um, and the top of the square share a line. Where in the square should the rectangle be? It should be at the bottom of the square and it should be centered horizontally. No, no, sorry, centered vertically. All right, if there aren't any more questions, then um, I'm going to let you draw and then I'm going to share with you what it should look like. All right, so here's what the picture should look like. It's on your screen. How many people got close to this picture? Okay, how many people did not get close to this picture? All right, so we got some people that say they were close-ish. Yeah, I like that. Some people that say they were not close, okay? So what was wrong with this requirements gathering session? What could we have done to made it, make it more efficient or effective? Thoughts? <laughs> Um, anybody would like to comment over the thing? I didn't realize I have to turn on the microphones individually for everybody on a webinar. So if anybody would like to um, chat with me about this in real time, just raise your hand and I'll give you access to chat. But let's see. Um, people are saying, okay, Tanya, let's have a conversation. Good. Is it Tanya?
Can you hear me, Tanya? Yes. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay. So let's see, I'm going to read through some of the comments here. They say, um, you could have worked with the requester. Yes, true. Ask questions to describe the outcome rather than the parts. Yes. You could have asked, what is the objective? Frequent check-ins to gauge progress. For sure, I could have given you, um, we could have done it iteratively. Make the requirements clear a little bit. Sure, standardized ruled paper or another tool to help with standardization. Yes. Um, and I could not hear you, Tanya, sorry. Attendees, oh, they can. I can't, but you can, all right. The question she's asking, and I don't know why I can't hear you, is, is this a, an example of unclear acceptance criteria or an example of just enough to get started expecting questions for refinement? Um, it's a little bit of both, right? And we will talk about this as we go. But what could we have also done? Um, so here's, a, oh, I heard something. Um, so there's a little bit of requirements issues here on both sides, right? Let's just say I was your product owner. I gave you kind of unclear requirements on purpose, sort of. Um, I did the best I could. Um, you didn't ask, as a technical team, say, didn't ask enough questions to get refinement. I didn't give you a chance to um, ask additional questions, right? So what kind of um, additional questions could you have asked now that you have done the project to tell what, um, you know, to make it better? Can you think of additional questions that you might have asked? Right, what are we trying to build? Get a bigger picture. The purpose of the request, yes, for sure. Oh, now I can hear someone trying to talk. I could, you could have asked for, to draw me a picture or to have created a, uh, like a wireframe or a mock-up, good. All right, right. So everything that everybody's saying is true. And so what this really boils down to is it boils down to requirements can be difficult to understand, right? They're difficult to gather. They're difficult to um, put down on paper, which is part of the reason that lots of companies are going to agile, right? To the iterative effect, we work closely with our customers to build requirements and things get a lot simpler hopefully, right, if they're done correctly. However, that's not always the case. So we still have holes in our process is where, and is where BDD is going to come into the picture. So I just noticed here how to turn everybody on so they can talk. So I am going to turn everybody on so that they can talk after you raise your hand. One second here. All right, who raised their hands? All right. Kelly, did you have something you wanted to say? You're on mute though. On. Okay, everybody now is able to talk if you would like. You just have to unmute yourself. So I'm just testing. There you go. That's better. Who was that? Karen. All right, Karen. Good. Sorry, everybody. This Zoom, they just, of course, did an update and they make it different. All right, so 
this is the struggle that we have when we're building requirements. Uh, and so I'm hoping to give you some tools and techniques with behavior driven development on how to make this um, process better. Now, for those of you on this call that are scrum masters or product owner or, or that hold retrospectives, this is a great exercise to do as a retrospective kind of, you should know what the picture looks like, kind of give these requirements and then um, kind of talk through this exercise with people. And then you can talk as a group on, are we doing some of these things and how can we make them better? Right? So did we miss some requirements? Did we have drawn some wireframes, all of those kinds of things. So um, I encourage you to use this as a little retrospective game, which I use a lot with companies when I work with them. All right. So tell me a little bit about the struggles. Everybody's on mute, but you're able to talk now. Tell me a little bit about the struggles that you have about when you start testing based on your requirements. What kind of struggles are you undergoing? So Nick, some of the struggles we're having right now is, is that they're moving too fast and 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 the requirements are way too vague and the testing team is not brought in and and the most thing probably would be we don't even have wireframes we don't have good requirements or acceptance criteria okay um and so what is happening just out of curiosity why would you say that you're moving too fast is it um do you have the proper roles, like a product owner that's defining these things? Well, so, aggressive so, timelines? So we try to roll out with Safe Agile. We started with a bunch of training for many, many folks to try to do roles, but then we really threw that out the window when it came down to the amount of money we were going to have to spend. And, and we're a mainframe shop also, so that we are reliant on our cycles every night sort of like um, at Blue Cross, uh, the Reliant, and, and we have it transferred over to <clears throat> um, full distributed or moving off of the mainframe at this point. Some, some parts of our company, uh, they're not so reliant on our batch cycles. So that would be one part of our company is, is doing multiple deployments daily. We can barely get one out a week. Okay. Um, and you think that's because the requirements are too vague and that they're mo you're moving too fast? Well, um, I think it's a multiple things. Um, we don't have seasoned scrum masters. Um, we're going off of just training and, and reading you know, books, we're not like living it, right? right? We're living it by fumbling through it. I mean, we're doing better than we used to, obviously, but it's it's pretty painful when um, some of the requirements are not drawn out and they expect the testers just to keep on going from day to day. And when one sprint ends, it truly doesn't end they don't really have a backlog grooming session. And so you have a lot of stragglers that are still left over from the sprint. And, and people are still working on that. Okay, perfect. So I'm gonna hopefully give you some techniques to, to, to work on that. Does anybody else have issues with testing? Do they struggle? So uh, one of the things I'm assuming what you're telling me also is that your testing isn't getting done in till the end of the process it's so you don't have enough time to do testing yes yeah right, that is cool. true. and and we're trying to do 20 and and we're trying to do 24 7 like we have an offshore group too so so we try to do a handoff and and we work during the day and and then as much as we can we can hand that off at night and then in the morning they come in and they check with us and, and we update and we do our, our simple scrums that we have in the morning. Okay. But we don't go over our tickets. 
we're just doing updates, like number updates, which isn't very effective a whole lot. It's just a status meeting of, of what percentage we got done last night. Oh, I see. Okay. Thank you. Anybody else having uh, testing struggles? How's your testing going? So this is Kathy. Um, we used to have dedicated testers. Um, we've been doing Agile for about four years now, and we basically eliminated the testing role. We made it a shared uh, function amongst the devs, the product owner. Uh, we still have analysts, so I think that skill set of doing like integration testing, regression testing is different and we didn't really train up the people then that took that over. So the devs are getting hit with a, a lot more testing than they used to. Okay. And there are inherent issues with having testers, developers test, right? They, yeah, outside of their unit testing. Right, it, and it's, it's kind of, you're asking people to check their own work sometimes, which can be a challenge. Okay, I like it. What else? Anybody else have any thoughts? Uh, yeah, this is Heidi. We just, our stories don't have enough details in them. And maybe at the time we think they're detailed enough and then you actually go to, to test and it's, you realize you didn't have enough information. Right. And this is my probably the number one thing that I hear about is that the stories look okay on day one of a sprint. Um, so assuming you're doing scrum and then you get to the last data sprint or towards the testing phase and people start to ask, you know, how are we supposed to test this? There's not enough information here. What about this? What about that? This is probably one of the number one issues that I hear. Yes, for sure. Anybody else have any thoughts? All right, so, and feel free to interrupt whenever you need to. Um, there's this you know, famous picture about how we perceive the, the world and how we perceive requirements, this kind of cartoon thing, right? When uh, one customer gives or one stakeholder gives this requirement or the, they write the user story, they have something very specific in their mind. So they document that and then when they you know, it gets passed down the line from the project managers to the analysts to the programmer and so on. Things get changed for lots of reasons. People have different perspectives, different ideas, or they start to gold plate things as they go along. So we have to be careful when we're writing requirements that everybody can understand them. Now, here are some of the you know reasons why projects fail. And as you can see here, uh, a lot of the reasons that projects have failed over traditionally is, this is an old statistic, but because of poor requirements, right, 50%. And I find this to be true, that a lot of organizations as they move towards an agile scrum mindset and start writing user stories, they go from writing what their detailed requirements that they used to do, their multiple page documents, down into these short blurb sentences on user stories which just aren't going to cut it. And then we wonder why we, we are, you know, we're not getting work done. Um, so user stories need to have a lot more detail than what they currently have uh, a lot of times. So that's what we're going to talk about and how we can write user stories uh, a little bit better. Um, now, the one thing that I wanted to talk about, about risk reduction here is in the bottom left hand, right, excuse me, right hand corner, there's this graph about risk reduction. Um, and we talk here about, this has to do a lot to do with on the waterfall, which is the orangish line, that we don't know what project is in trouble until near the end of the project. And it's because the develop, you know, everything takes longer than it's supposed to. And nobody actually gets to start testing a project on waterfall until the end of a waterfall project. So until the testers start to look at it, we don't know whether there's you know, any issues or not. And of course, testers are the, the group of people that get squeezed when time runs short. So if we need, um, you know, developers use extra time, analysts use extra time, 
But in Agile, the whole concept is we're supposed to test as we go and continue to do regression type testing so that we know that each story works, that we have a fully functional piece of functionality that we could put in production. And then we move on to the next one. And then we, um, so risk reduces as we go. And the risk reduces primarily because of the testing, because we are testing smaller increments of things as, as we go along. So this is key to understanding why um, behavior driven development and specifically if you can get to the point where you're automating your tests, how this curve risk reduction curve actually can um, slope even more to reduce risk even more. So I'm going to try to give you some ways of doing that. Now I'm including in your appendix that I'm going to send you the book if you request it, this, this scrum cheat sheet. And I'm assuming for this particular class that we're talking, we're going to talk about scrum and everybody understands how Scrum works, right? You have a product backlog, which is a master list of all of your requirements. And then on day one of a sprint, the team gets together, gathers um, all of their, looks at all the stories that the product owner would like them to work on. They commit to a sprint backlog. Then every single day they have a daily stand-up meeting or daily Scrum where they discuss the three questions what am I working on today? What am I gonna, what did I work on yesterday? And do I have any impediments? Um, and then of course, at the end of the sprint, they have a review where they demonstrate what they've done to the product owner. And then they do their retrospective and the whole cycle starts over. So that's kind of how the Scrum life cycle works in a nutshell. All right, I have one question here, let me ask it. Um, so when you, ex when you expect stakeholders in testing with you also, so would you expect, excuse me, and the answer to that is yes, I would expect stakeholders in testing also, and I will explain that as we go. Good question, Kelly. All right, so I will include this scrum cheat sheet. And then here is a larger piece of framework that we are going to refer to a little bit throughout this class. So, that this first cheat sheet here was the basics of Scrum. This is how it works more in an enterprise mode, right? You have a product backlog, a master list of all of the things that need to get accomplished over the next um, year, six months, however you're breaking that down. And then somewhere along the way, a product owner and the team uh, breaks that down into smaller chunks into maybe releases or you know, quarterly cycles or however. And then those, those requirements then are broken down even further and adjusted into sprint backlogs. So requirements um, are not touched just once. I say that requirements should be touched at least a minimum of three times and been refined at least three times at the product level, the release backlog level, and the sprint level, which I refer to later on in another cheat sheet as level one, level two and level three. So we need to be refining requirements as we go. All right, so let's talk a little bit about behavior driven development and what does that really mean? All right, I'm gonna bring up my page here. All right. So behavior driven development is actually pretty, the concept is pretty simple. It describes, when you're talking about behavior driven development, it just describes what you want the system to do by way of examples. So it really, it talks about when you're writing user stories from a behavior driven development and you're writing acceptance criteria, we want to start thinking about using concrete examples on the way people would actually use a system. It sounds simple and it sounds like something that you're probably already doing, but I'm willing to bet that you're not exactly doing that. And so we want to work from an outside in approach, right? To implement those behaviors from the outside in. What that means is we start focusing on the customer value on what the customer is going to do. Now, when we talk about behavior driven development, we want to bring all kinds of voices into the table for validation. And that would include the actual customer, 
it would include the product owners, it would include stakeholders, other developers, anybody that's actually going to be using the systems. Okay. Generally, these requirements are then written, of course, by the product owner. They are the ones that are responsible for it. But of course, they can reach out to whoever they need to to help. Most organizations use business analysts or quality assurance specialists to help write those tests and help write those stories. And I am going to show you that here in just a moment. All right. So BDD stands for Behavior Driven Development, which talked about before. And the whole approach here in behavior driven development is to create a shared understanding of how the software was, is to be built and in what those requirements are. Now the key elements when you're writing behavior driven development user stories and acceptance tests is you want to think about writing things in a natural language, um, a natural English language. We want to start getting rid of domain specific language. Oops, Spe um, specifically we want to get rid of acronyms that aren't known by everybody in the company. We don't want to use uh, language that only the business partners understand. We don't want to use language that's only the technical people understand. We need to find a shared natural language that is ubiquitous across the entire company that everybody at all levels can understand when they read a requirement. Um, and this can get very tricky because we think that we're doing it and then we hand a requirement to the developers and they don't understand what your business term is and then the developers will add some details to it and they'll use their fancy developer language and then when the product owner looks at them, they don't have a clue what's going on. So we, these first three here um, are kind of go together. We want to build a natural, ubiquitous, domain-specific language that we can all understand. And the reason we do that is because we want to build some shared processes and some shared tools across the entire um, development team, starting from the customer to the end developer and end tester. So we're trying to create a shared understanding. And the other reason why we do these things is that in odds, it adds um, to making automation easier if we're using a, a certain tool sets, if you use certain tool sets. So these are the key elements and the key reasons why we want to go uh, explore behavior-driven development. Okay, so behavior-driven development approach to writing user stories and acceptance criteria can be divided really into, like I said before, two main parts. The first part is, a, is the practice, practice of using examples written in that ubiquitous language that we talked about before to illustrate behaviors that you want the system to perform. Um, the key thing to think about here is that behaviors and functionality can be misunderstood. There is a difference between a behavior that you want a system to do and the functionality. And the way I think about it is um, behavior is a higher level of concept than functionality. So you, when you're talking about you want something to behave a certain way, a function is something that that would do then, right? And then we're going to give an example by talking about ATM machines here in, in just a moment. The second a reason, second part, is that we want to use examples to describe the behavior so that we can create better tests, tests, automated tests and testing scenarios. Okay. So we're going to start by defining stories as behaviors and we're going to give specific examples of how we want those behaviors to work to create better tests and an acceptance criteria. All right, any questions so far? All right, so I'm gonna cover some tooling here real quick because I keep I'm using some terms that I wanna make sure everybody understands. So BDD, Behavior Driven Development, is a framework for writing user stories. That's the way I think about it. And writing acceptance tests. 
and it's written in a very specific language called Gherkin, which we are going to cover those um, the, uh, Gherkin in here in just a moment. But it writes stories um, and acceptance criteria using the Gherkin language, which is are the given when then structure, which you might have heard before. And if you're a tester, some of this might be semi familiar. Then there are many frameworks then that automated tools that take the BDD framework and, and aut create automated tests. And those tools that you may have heard of before are ones like Cucumber, which I use, oops, which I'm going to be using in this class. I'm going to show you some Cucumber demonstrations. Um, there is one called Behave. There's one called EasyB. There are, there are um, there's one called SpecFlow. And these tools are, are are written in a way that they are, they can be a separate language from the code in which you are writing the, um, the actual underlying functionality that you're building. So sometimes you want them to match the code type, you know, C sharp, Java, those kinds of things. Other time you do don't. And so depending on your structure, and these are things that architects in your company would help you pick out a framework. But when I'm referring to Cucumber, I'm referring to the process of automating tests using a tool. So that's what that means. BDD is the framework. Cucumber is the tool that automates the framework. Okay. You can, of course, do BDD without a tool. Um, and I actually recommend that you kind of start without the tools. If you don't have the tools, you can definitely use all the things I'm talking about because of those things we talked about, right? Creating an a natural language to construct stories, the domain specific language, the ubiquitous language, understanding shared process, all of those things um, become much easier if you're using those things to write uh, user stories using behavior driven development. So don't think that you have to have a tool set, an automated tool set to, um, to have BDD because you, you don't, for sure you don't have to. All right, so the first thing that the next topic that I want to talk about is the BDD story format. And here's what I'd like to do. If everybody goes, um, I'm going to drop this link in the, in the group chat. I think that's the best way to, to do it. There is this kind of interesting simulation and I'll put it on my screen also. I'm going to do a new share. If everybody, I dropped that thing in there. If you go to this website here, there is this kind of, um, it's a game for kids that this bank has developed that I use a lot in, in my classes because it's great. It's an, it's an ATM machine. And everybody should be familiar with how an ATM machine works. All right, so here's the thing at this. Um, to make this simulation work, you just kind of click on the card. And it goes in and, oops, and then it says, you know, select your language. selecting your language, uh -oh. remember that only English and Arabic are available on a real ATM. Although you... We'll turn that off. Sorry. This is, of course, to teach. Um, you want the chat link again? I'll send it again. There it is. So you'd, go, you'd walk through English. Um, oops, I chose Arabic by mistake. That link, is it coming through to the webinar chat? Oh, it is not. Well, oh, that's not good. Um, let's see, all panelists. Is it not coming through? Did I just sent it again? No. Weird. I think maybe you should select all panelists and attendees. Okay. How about that? Go. Thank you. No? We got it. All right. Sorry about that. So this simulation is, of course, from a, a bank an Arabic bank, but it's really, it's still valid. The only thing I want you to know is that you'd want to choose English. And when they're talking about checking accounts, they call those um, 
current accounts. So you put in some PIN numbers, hit enter. If you're talking about a checking account, they call it current. And then a savings account is down here. So here's what I'd like to do real quick. On our first little break, we're gonna take a quick 10 minute break um, because I know everybody's got emails they need to check and I want to keep you focused. But I'd like you also to write one user story on, if you were to write a user story on any piece of functionality of an ATM machine, how would you write that user story? So if everybody could uh, think about how you'd write a user story and maybe drop it inside of the group chat, We'll discuss those in just a few minutes. So let's see, it's about 10 to, um, I have 10, I, what time is it? I have 10 to, no? Yeah, so let's take a quick seven minute break and we'll come back at exactly the top of the hour. How is that? And we're gonna talk about your user story. All right, just one moment, I'm plugging my computer.
All right, so it's the top of the hour already. All right, hopefully everybody got a chance to write a quick user story and go ahead and drop it in here in the thread. All right, it looks like we have some people that write good user stories, at least the as a bank member, I want to get cash advances from my credit card via the ATM. I'm not going to read them all. I'll just read some. As a customer, I want to be able to draw cash in $20 increments. Good. Uh, given that I'm a user that wants to check their current bank balance and I live in the United States, when I press the option to see my balance on screen, then I should be presented with a current balance in a dollar amount. All right, Christine Webb, I like that one. That's, I'll talk about that one. Users should be able to use a credit card ATM machine to dispense cash, good. As any banking client, I want to print the statement to see the last 10 day transactions. All right, so when it, uh, let me go back to my presentation here. So we had talked a little bit about outside in development. I'm going to cover that one more time because when we're talking about outside in development, it's not really a new concept, but it's one that sometimes gets ignored when we start writing user stories or gets kind of thrown to the wayside. So remember, we want to always focus on satisfying the needs of the stakeholder or who the customer is. And one of the things that I want to point out here is we got to remember who the stakeholder is. A stakeholder is not the product owner necessarily. We're focusing on the needs of the customer. Um, now sometimes that can be one in the same, but oftentimes the product owner and most times, especially if you're working with um, software that has an outside face, you know, like it's a website or an ATM machine or a forms that you're having clients fill out or you know, banking software, health insurance software, all of those things, the product owner is really not the person using them. They are representing the needs of a customer. So we want to make sure that we're always focused on the customer stakeholder needs. Okay. Um, we want to create, we want to always be focused on creating successful software. Then we, in order to do that, we need to have clear understanding of goals and motivations of the stakeholder. We have to understand why they're doing what they're doing. And then we wanna always focus on creating software that is consumable. So we're always focusing on that outside customer, right? That's the thing that I wanna make sure that we're always talking about is we're, we're focusing on the outside customer, the person, the end user, all right. We talked about this. I wanted to make sure we talk about it one more time. When we're writing stories, make sure that you're using a natural language, no jargon, and make sure you're talking about things that are specific um, terms and concepts that everybody understands. This is key. This is why I keep harping on this over and over. We want to make sure that um, the requirements are easy to understand by everybody involved. Okay. Now, when we are talking about user stories, the thing that we need to also understand is that the user story is a way to communicate. It is ultimately the way that we are going to communicate the behavior of the customer. Okay. A technical person is going to walk through an item's functionality with the business person, and then the analyst in the system is going to work through the flows, but we're always going to be focused on the customer. Oops, someone had a question, I think. Oh, dropping some more user stories in. Okay, we want to make sure that when we're writing user stories that it's a way to start a conversation, right? That's what user stories really are. And we're talking again about behaviors. And a lot of these slides in here I know are really wordy. We're not going to read through them all because you're uh, I'll give you a copy of the deck and that way you can read through it later. I deliberately made them wordy so that when you read through them later and you can say, well, what was Nick talking about? Why are we changing the way we're writing user stories? You can actually go through these, you know, and, and understand, remember what I was saying. Um, user stories are a way of creating shared capital, right? It's a way of building um, documentation 
it's a way of building understanding across everybody's um, point of view. So we all start to understand how the system works and we all start to understand um, how the customers are going to interact by creating this shared capital, right? It also moves it to a level, the right level of that abstraction. By writing things in English, then things are at the right level of abstraction that we can create that shared capital. Okay. All right. So we talked about, um, I'm going to skip that slide. We're going to talk about the, the basic agile story format is, as most of you said, as a, I want, so that, which most of you did, the people that wrote the given when then you get extra bonus points. We're going to talk about that here in just a moment. Um, and I think most of you did a good job of describing the as a ATM customer, right? And then you, they want to be able to transfer money from one account to another, detailing the source account and the destination account and the amount, then receives the confirmation or failure or, or of a failure or success and get a ticket of evidence. Okay, so that's the last story that we're gonna focus on that one that Ricardo wrote, because it's a pretty good story. He's got all the components in it. It has a, enough information, I think, for a standard user story. Now, the one thing that we're going to do when we start talking about behavior-driven development is we might want to start focusing on the in order to piece, which describes the outcome that they're looking for and the behavior that the customer would like to see, okay? So we're gonna flip the format just a little bit and we're gonna say, in order to do something, then we're gonna talk about the person that's using it and what their goal is. Can you guys think of any reasons why we might want to flip this, just based on what we've talked about before? Why would behavior-driven development want us to flip the order of the way these things work? Okay. Right, and you are, because we want to focus on the customer's objectives. That's absolutely correct, right? We're starting with the big picture. We're starting with the objectives. And more importantly, the in order to describes the behavior that the customer wants to see happen, right? And Ricardo said, because we'll allow the developer to understand what the PO wants to accomplish. And I would agree with everything you're saying there, although I would substitute the word customer. I would say because it will allow the world to understand what the customer wants to accomplish. Okay. Otherwise, we're gonna flip this just a little bit. We're gonna say in order to do something, as an ATM user, I want, this is the functionality that I want. Remember I said we were gonna focus on behavior then functionality. So we're flipping these. It's a subtle change in how you write user stories, but it can become very effective. What are some of the other advantages can you think of, of under describing the behavior that someone wants, then the functionality that they might use to get that behavior? Why, what are some of the advantages of flipping that besides to start with the big picture, which is a huge part of it? Okay, are we getting shy? All right, one of the big reasons why we flip this is because a lot of times if you go back and look at your user stories uh, and you talk about why they're not written correctly and how they get implemented incorrectly is because a lot of times the behavior that we want to see directly contradicts the functionality that we're trying to build, right? We will say, this is the thing that we want to happen. This is the behavior. And then you say, so I want to be able to do functions that do this in order to achieve that behavior. But in the long run, 
those functions don't achieve the actual behavior that you're looking to get. Now, the reason we don't see this currently, and this sometimes may not become an issue, is because a lot of teams have a tendency to not describe the behavior that they're looking for. That kind of part of the story kind of trails off. It'll say, I want to be able to withdraw um, as an ATM user. I want to be able to take money out, but they don't say why, or they don't say the behavior that they're looking for. So then the team blindly builds functionality. And then when we turn it over to the product owner for testing or for approval, they say, well, that doesn't do what we want it to do. And it's because you, the product owner sometimes didn't tell us the behavior that they actually wanted the functionality to achieve. So we're kind of switching things up on our head a little bit here to describe behaviors first and then functionality. Okay. Now, components of a user story. Um, yes. So the question was, so it's about defining the meaning of a function. And that's exactly true. It, that's, I couldn't have said it better. My ramblings, I should have just said that. It's about defining the meaning of a function. Exactly. Perfect. Okay, so user stories generally are written in two kind of components. There's the user story itself, which has a title sometimes, depending on which tool you use um, to store your, you know, how you track your user stories. Um, and then in that would have, you know, the function, the new function of in order to, as a, the user, I want to do this, right? So this is the normal user story function. And then the second component of a user story is the acceptance criteria or the test. Now, some organizations break acceptance criteria and tests into actually separate components, which is perfectly okay. So you might have a three component story instead of a two, but at a minimum, you should always have at least two components to every story, the actual user story portion up at the top and the acceptance criteria or acceptance tests at the bottom, which are then written in the given when then. However, you can also write the top portion, the user story portion component as a given when then also. So some of you that did that above, those are bonus points for doing that in that other fashion at the top there. All right, real quick, I'd like to take a quick poll and just have everybody put in the, the chat, um, which tool do your organizations use to track your user stories? Are you using um, TFS? Are you using Azure, Jira? Okay. Good. Do you use paper? Okay. Oh, Excel, good. A lot of Jira users. Both Jira and TFS, all right. Do you, um, for those of you using Jira and TFS, which is the most of you, are you using the cloud version? or are you using the on-prem version? And if you don't know, you don't have to answer, but does anybody do know for sure using the cloud version or the on-prem version? Okay. I'm always curious what organizations are using. All right, thank you. So components of user story, two components. I call the top ports in the, the user story component and then the acceptance criteria test component. All right. So remember when you're writing acceptance criteria, they should be clearly stated. And those are the pieces of the story that define the requirements or the functionality that you're trying to achieve. achieve. And it is the piece that actually helps synchronize the vision across the developers and the testers, right? It also helps with estimating the stories. It provides a picture of risk. It provides the base for automated testing and regression testing, okay? 
this piece in the middle here, this synchronized division between the developers and the testers is really important because a lot of times um, we get better about helping the, the developers understand what the stories are. They synchronize the vision between product owner and developer. And then when we hand the story off to the tester at the end of a sprint to test, their vision is sometimes different because it's not synchronized across. So appropriate acceptance criteria definitely helps synchronize the vision across um, the developers and testers. So this is a great little cheat sheet to have. But when we start to write acceptance criteria using a behavior driven format, we switch the context a little bit and we start talking about them in the Gherkin format, which is this given when then context. So you might have a user story and then you start to give specific examples of how the functionality is going to be used. So a Gherkin format acceptance criteria is an example of how a user is actually going to use the system. We always use uh, the basic keywords given, when, and then. Given, which we'll talk more about later, sets up the context. It describes what the initial starting position of the test will be on. Right. Are we going to be on a specific screen? Or are we going to be on a specific field? If you're halfway through an application, um, where, where are you starting the test from? So it kind of makes some assumptions that everything up to this point has worked. Right? So we're starting the test at this, the starting point. The when then tells us the event that we are going to do. You know, what the trigger is, what are we going to do? We're going to fill out these things and then we're going to press enter, right? We're going to put in our pen number and then we press enter. And then the then statement describes the outcome that we would expect. It's the validation. So given that I am on the home screen of an ATM machine, when I enter my pen number one, two, three, four and press enter, then I should receive a message that says, welcome to the ATM machine, right? Because that's exactly what the user would do. It's an actual example. Okay, and notice remember that I actually gave you my PIN number. When I put the PIN number of 4273 and hit enter, that's an actual example. So you wanna say that. And if that was a good one, then you'd say the outcome is go to the welcome screen. If you have an example that's a, a negative test case, then you'd say, given I'm on the home screen, when I enter my PIN number of 5231 and press enter, I should receive a sorry invalid PIN number warning. Because remember, these are always written from the perspective of the end user. It's an example of what they're going to be doing. The question is, should be, defined the, should be defined the acceptance criteria for each expected scenario? Um, do you want to elaborate on the question just a little bit more? So if you have an acceptance, you should have, um, go ahead, Christine, no, do you want to say something? Oh, okay. Um, so you should have, you should define an acceptance criteria for every expected scenario. Yes, positive scenarios, negative scenarios, um, edge case scenarios, all of those things. You would define a, um, acceptance criteria as an example, an actual example for each one of those scenarios. Yes, so you definitely would. All right. Good. All right, so let's take some of your stories that you just wrote 
Okay, who defines acceptance criteria is the next question. I'm gonna answer that, but we're gonna talk about specific roles and the timing of how all of this happens later. But the person that defines the acceptance criteria, the group of people are the product owner, the tester, and the developer. They all three do it. They're called the three amigos. But we'll talk about that in great detail. I'll show you, give you some charts here in just a moment. All right, so I'm gonna pick a story here and I'll drop it in. Let's take one of your stories that you wrote, just a second here. I'm gonna use this story. I'm just randomly picking one. I'm gonna, and let's see. We use this story. How would you write a, some acceptance tests, acceptance criteria for this story Using the, using the Gherkin format. Take a few seconds here and kind of think about how you would do that and drop them into the group chat. The, the story is, as a ATM customer, I would like the option to do fast cash withdrawal to avoid having to go through all the normal screens for withdrawal. All right, so given this is your story, how would you write your Gherkin test? I'll give you a few minutes. All right, anybody else have any? Got one so far. got some good examples here. So let's read some of them and we'll talk about them. Now here's the word that I want you to, when you're, remember we're talking about the bottom portion of the, the story now, the, the acceptance criteria or tests. And I want you to always use, when you're writing them, to think of the example of, or think of the phrase, real life scenario, right? So this is a real life scenario and it's an actual example of what you're going to do. 
So I'm going to start with this one that Bambi wrote, and then I'll go backwards. Given I am at the welcome screen, so she's saying I'm on the welcome screen, so this is the context where we start. When I click the fast cash withdrawal button, then I am prompted to enter my PIN, one, two, three, four, and dollar sign, and the dollar amount I want to take out. Okay, so this is a, a good start of one. So let's talk about it. You have your get given, and you say where we're gonna start, and then you say when I click the fast cash button, good. Um, then you should be prompted to enter my PIN number, one, two, three, four. So you gave an actual example of the PIN number, which is good, um, which you'd wanna do, and the amount I wanna take out. So in this particular case, remember this is a real life scenario that you're setting up for, for testers. So you would actually include the amount that they wanted to take out. Right? This, is the, this is an actual scenario. So this is good except for, you'd probably wanna put the actual amount that they wanted to take out. Let's go back one more. In order to avoid standing in a long line, I'd like the ATM machine to verify my info and allow me to withdraw cash. Um, this is more of the component number one of a story and, and less of an acceptance criteria, but this is a great component number one. It tells me exactly what the customer would like to do. This one from Dana. Given I'm on the welcome screen, good. When I select FastCast 60, which is the name of the button on the welcome screen, good. And she's saying, and my balance is greater than 60, good. Then I get my cash in my card and I'm exited from the system. Um, so that sounds pretty good. You're telling me the real life example. Every single step that I would do is if I started on the welcome screen to get um, fast cash. So um, Dana, you can answer either in purpose. On this one here, are you assuming then that you've already validated your card PIN number on the welcome screen? Yes, so then this is perfect because we're assuming then that we've already, we've already, we've already um, done that step. So we're starting really on step two, right? The given there on the welcome screen. So in this particular scenario, there might've been another test uh, before this that actually tested the, um, the, the ATM PIN number. Given I have entered a valid PIN number, when I select fast cash, the ATM dispenses blank dollars if balance amount, if balance is greater than the amount requested. So um, this one here, they're saying they're given that they've already entered their PIN number. That's good, just like what Dana said. When they select the fast class cash button, then it should dispense the cash if the balance is greater. So that's a good one too, because it's a real life example. So if we go back to our, let's go back up here a little more. As, uh, okay, good. So I want you to always remember that these are real life examples that you would talk about, that you'd write to test a user story. So let's go back to um, our ATM machine here. Where did it go? Where did it go? Here. Let's bring it up. Um, how do I? I'm going to. Refresh it so it comes back up. All right, so let's say that you have a user story here to, to, to write. Um, the user story is, as a user, I would like to be able to um, have my PIN number validated so that I am secure that I am the only one taking money out of my checking account. What kind of acceptance tests using real life examples, could you write using the given when then format to validate that you have the, um, to test the validation process? How would you do that? Any, let's write a few there real quick. How would you write real life examples? Take a second and let's do some of those.
So when you're talking about behavior-driven development, I just want you to always remember that it's about real life examples of the user story that you're trying to, to test. So it's what the customer would actually be doing if they were on your screen or your um, program. Okay, so Heidi wrote one here. Let's talk about hers. On the welcome screen, so given you're on the welcome screen, oops, sliding here. When I insert my card and enter my PIN, it will display the screen allowing me to choose the transaction to select. So what's missing from this acceptance test to make it a good acceptance test? Does anybody know? The PIN number, correct. So you'd wanna actually put the PIN number in and then you'd tell us whether, um, right? So you, and, and for this particular one, you'd probably wanna write two test cases, right? You'd wanna write one for a good pen and a bad pen, right? And then it might take you to the actual home screen or to a, an invalid screen, good. So let's look at Tanya's. Given a user is, is prompted on ATM machine to enter pen, when they enter pen, five, this pen 3579 is entered, the user is validated as a, oh, this invalid user for this account. So you did a negative test case. Good. Um, the, what, so Tanya wrote a really good given, given she's on the prompt on the ATM machine to enter a pen, when you enter this pen is entered, then the user is validated as invalid users. Can anybody see what might be wrong with the then statement here? Right, so you'd actually, and she's answering your own question, right? You're not clear on what the outcome is. Because remember, it's all about the customer. So the customer standing there, they enter a PIN number, and then they hit enter, and then it would be how do they know whether it worked or not. So a good way to think about writing behavior-driven tests is you would wanna write them in a way, say for this ATM machine, that say I gave you these test cases and you're, you've never used an ATM before, and I give them to you and say, go stand at that ATM machine and put hit 3579, and then I hit enter, and then it would, you'd have to tell them what they would expect to happen next, right? Do you see a good screen? Do you see a bad screen? Do you see a flashing red light? Does the, does the machine shock you, right? How would the user know that the outcome was um, positive or negative, or what should the outcome have been? Yeah, so you're, we're getting there. So it's all about the customer and their real life example and on what the customer actually would see. Good. So I, I know I har keep harping on these real examples here, but why do you think that we want to talk about real life examples always? Why do you think we want to talk about behaviors? Right, because we're actually trying to, to, yes, to simulate the action of the real customer and to meet the customer's expectation, right? So the thing that we get sometimes get bogged down in when we're defining um, requirements is we get locked down into, we can start talking about the minutia, which is important, but really what's important in the end is are we meeting our customer's expectations, right? If they can do these things on the screen, that means that all of these things in the background have to have worked, right? The validation procedure has to have worked. The, um, 
the counting mechanisms in the machine had to have worked in order to dispense money, right? So if we, if we accomplish this one piece of function, customer functionality, these minor functionalities underneath the details have to work also. So we are actually writing test cases at a higher level now in order to make sure that they, the lower level works. All right, so I wanna talk a little bit about test-driven development here real quick because it's important to understand where we're coming from here and I wanna make sure we're not, we don't have a misunderstanding. So test-driven development, what test-driven development is, it's, it's a development practice that developers have used for a long time in which they write tests to code, to test the code that they've written. So the way test-driven development works is a developer will write tests first on the functionality that they're going to be writing. And this is at their code level, inside their code. They'll write these tests, uh, write a test. Then the developer runs the test. Now, since there's no code behind the test, it will fail. So step one here is they write the test, then they run the test and the test will fail because there's no code. That's called being a red status. Then they write the underlying code for the test and then they rerun the test and it should pass if they wrote the code correctly. And then they refactor. So this is called test first development or test driven development. And we do this because then we, we know exactly what we're being tested on. The developers know exactly what their code should do, no more or no less. And so they write the code to pass the tests only. Now these tests and test driven development from a developer standpoint are then are run over and over and over again. So uh, today they write these tests, they write the code and they pass. And then that means that that functionality that they wrote inside the, their system works. Tomorrow, they rerun those same tests and they make sure that something along the way didn't break their code, right? So as they go on and on and on, they're constantly rerunning these tests to make sure they didn't break their code that they wrote yesterday or the day before or the day before that. This is a best practice in in software development for coders to write tests first. But we've never really done this at the user story level or at the requirements level. So what we are saying now is that we want to start writing our tests first on how we're going to test the user story is done. And we do that by starting to define behaviors that the system will do. Now the example that I like to give is test-driven development and behavior-driven development work hand in hand. But let's say that we are um, writing tests to make sure our car works correctly. Now, as the, the behavior-driven test would be something like, when given that the user is sitting inside the car, when they turn the car key, the key, the ignition should start. That's a high level test, right? A lower level test, as the developer is developing the engine itself, there would be a test for say the spark plug. Validate that the, they would write a test that says the spark plug generated spark. Then they would write a test underneath that that says and validate that the pistons are moving at the correct speed. Then they would say and then validate this for every piece of the engine, they would write their inside test. But as outside, testers, we don't understand how that code works. So we leave that minutia testing to the testers themselves and we test high level pieces of functionality at a higher level to say this is the behavior that my customer would expect. And if it, if it passes that behavioral test, that should mean that all the developers test also passed at the same time. If the behavior test doesn't pass, then the testers can start looking at their individual tests to see where those components broke down. So the testers are still going to write their test-driven development in a test-first manner. And we as users and as product owners and customers are going to write our test 
first approach in the behavior driven format and they start to work hand in hand together. Now there are a couple differences between test driven development and behavior driven development. Behavior driven development, remember I told you, were written in a language that anybody could use at any time that's in just plain English. Test driven tests, the tester side, are written in code specific language. So, if you have an ATM, say, an ATM scenario, and we write a bunch of behavior driven tests, and those tests pass, and then for some reason we decide we are gonna rewrite the, the software for an ATM machine, the back end software, and we're gonna change it from, say, C to Java code. The testers would have to rewrite all of their test driven tests again, but our behavior driven tests should work because the behavior of the system is not changing. So the only time we ever change the behavior driven test is if the behavior is going to change. That makes behavior driven tests more portable. We can move them to other you know, types of, um, they move, they can move. They also make them um, portable, right? And they make them regression testable. So now we can start stringing behaviors together and we can start creating regression tests that test things as we go from a behavior standpoint. I know I'm covering an awful lot here. So we want to start thinking about behavior driven tests as accepting tests first from a behavior standpoint. All right, I covered a lot of topics there about test driven development and behavior driven development and why we write things in a behavior driven development in such a way. Um, I'm curious, do you have any questions so far about behavior driven tests and why we write them this way? And while you're thinking about that, when I normally would teach this class to say a group of, let's say I'm work at a, at a company where we're doing banking software or something, we would actually take your stories and we would then start to write behavior driven tests underneath them. So it would make more sense because you'd understand your, your domain, right? Now behavior driven tests, so far we've talked about them strictly in the, in the domain of, of an actual user interface. Right, so you might, we're talking about this ATM machine, which is a user interface, or we might be talking about an online banking screen, which is a user interface, um, or forms on screen, which are user interfaces. So that's one way, those are behaviors that a customer is going to see. But you can also write behavior-driven tests to test APIs, or to test database structures, or all of those things. It's the same concept, it's the behavior that you would see, right? So if you're testing the database, you'd say this is the behavior that the customer is doing on the front. And in the back end, the then statement says, this is what's gonna happen in the database, right? So I don't want you to get the impression that if you're only doing, if you're not doing front end work, then you can't do behavior driven tests because you definitely can. I'm just kind of using this front end example of an ATM as an example. Um, in your def, okay, a couple questions. In your def, in your definitions, are these separate roles for BDD and TDD, like a tester and a developer? Um, so in TDD, all of the work is done by the developer, always. That's just the, that's their domain. In BDD, when you're writing the front end behavior driven tests. That is a group effort done by testers, developers, and product owners. So we're gonna to get to the roles here in just a moment. And can I write a, a database example? Yeah, so a good database example, if you're talking about the ATM machine, would be, um, say, uh, given I'm on the screen and I request 
$60, then I should be dispensed the $60. And then you might have more than statements that say, and then the, the table value should change from this to this, and they should have a, a decrement in their balance from this to this. So you'd start listing then what would happen inside the database if you want to test that particular portion. So it's written just the same, but then you focus on the database, what's going to happen inside the database. But it's important to understand what the customer is going to do so that the database developer, when they're writing their code, can understand exactly what's expected to happen, right? They're expecting a de decrement and balance. They're expecting historical records to be written, whatever those things are. Good question. Uh, I had a thought and it disappeared. What was I gonna tell you? All right, another thing that I should probably bring up is, remember I told you before when I was talking about the user stories, before we take our next break, I wanna talk about this real quick. So I had told you here that user stories, I think of them as having two components a user story part, the top part, and then they have the acceptance criteria and the acceptance test, which is the bottom part, which is the Gherkin format we've been talking about. Um, a lot of organizations start to define things like, what are the rules for a PIN number, right? So let's say a PIN number has to have, um, you know, uh, let's say you're talking about accessing a website and it has to be eight characters long and it has to be um, one special character, right? And it has to be at least one uppercase. So those are the rules that you have. You can define those rules in a separate location. So remember I said some organizations define these in three parts. So they have a title, the acceptance criteria, which would be the rules, eight characters, one special, one upper, and then they write the tests that are separate as a separate component of the user story. And if you were gonna write those as a separate component like that, you would have to write a test case then that covers all of the different permutations of the a good password and bad password. So you'd say, given that I enter ABC capital three, and then, uh, and when I push enter, it would reject, right? And then I, so you'd actually then have all these different permutations that you could think of for good passwords and bas bad passwords. So it is possible to have a separate section for your business rules also. Can we, how can we write non-functional aspects of software in BDD? Um, generally, you're talking about technical type requirements. Can you give me an example of a non-functional? Then I'll I can answer. The, I just want to make sure we're on the same page using that term. Okay, waiting. Um, oh, like performance or related, okay. Or response time, okay. So I see what you're talking about by non-functional requirements. So these non-functional requirements would be, remember I told you there's, just we just talked about the three components. Those would actually be acceptance criteria under a user story and not necessarily test. And then those fall into the test-driven development side for the testers only to work on. So if you've got non-functional or technical type stories, that's where test-driven development takes over because BDD and test-driven development go hand in hand. BDD tests the behaviors from a customer perspective. Test-driven development tests the system as a whole or as a component or functionality uh, from a developer standpoint. So if you had a response time story, the testers would cover that on their test-driven development side. So if you have specific requirements that you need to have tested that are non-functional, 
you'd have to put specific acceptance criteria in a story. You'd have to break the story into a third component. We use NFR to identify common components a developer can code. Then the US implements that component. Um, what's NFR? Tanya, I'm not sure what that acronym means. Non-functional requirements, got it. <laughs> we use non-functional requirements to identify common components a developer can code. Then the US implements the component. then the user story implements the component. Yes, you could do that for sure, um, right? So that would be the, the non-functional requirements would be covered under the test driven development test that the tester is right. And then the, the user story would be covered under the behavior driven development test on how the, be, how the customer is actually going to, to interact with the functionality. So yes, you could break them up like that. There are advantages, disadvantages, depending on which world will you work into doing it that way? Um, but yes, that, that's definitely something you can do. And then you're breaking the test driven development and the behavior side into two different components. All right, good question. All right, so let's take a quick break before we hit the last hour of our topics here on roles and responsibilities. Again, it's about seven minutes or so before the top of the hour. So let's just come back at the top of the hour and we will cover roles and responsibilities and how we bring this all together to fit. I know this is a lot to cover in three hours, but I'm hoping and give you, you know, some, some food for thought here. Anyway, we'll come back at the top of the hour. How's that? If you have questions, go ahead and post them or we, I'm just sitting here so you can chat with me.
All right. So I wanted to go through real quick and show you if you send an email, what I'll show I'll give you in a little bit to uh, one of my colleagues, I'm going to send you a free copy of this behavior driven development foundations book that we've created. Um, and in that book, we have several different things. We have our scrum cheat sheet that you can use if you'd like. We have this agile BDD framework slide, which is very handy, which we're going to also be covering. Um, we have an overview here of what behavior driven development is. Um, and all the kind of stuff that we have covered throughout the class. We have some slides on or some pages on roles and responsibilities, which we're covering here next. How to write user stories and scenarios. The Gherkin reference, how you write Gherkin, um, all the rules and things that how that works. Um, we then give you some examples and how to do all of that good stuff. This is very handy. Um, this might seem like a lot of rules, but this is all the stuff you need to know if you were going to automate this. So this is really all you would need to know. And then we're going to talk at the very end here. There's one more section on test driven development. So this book might be kind of handy for you and I encourage you to And you know what. I'm not sharing the book. Darn it. Was I I'll show you. Sorry. 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 Um, so it looks like this. It's a very handy book. I like it. I've spent a lot of time on it. I would love to send it to you. So I'll give you the email here in just a little bit and you can um, ask a request for sure. All right. Did somebody raise their hand? Let's see. Somebody raised their hand. Who raised their hand? Thought someone did. I think I did by mistake. Sorry. Oh, okay. Just want to want to leave you hanging there. All right. So let's cover. We have a couple more topics here. We're running out of time. Might have to do a part two to this session. All right. So this here um, is what well, is a BDD framework um, cheat sheet that I have, and I actually created this for a client recently, and I think it's so great that I've been sharing it with everybody else. Remember I had told you before that there are many levels to the backlog. There's level one, level two, level three, and level four, All right? So the, the backlog progressively gets refined as you go. Now, each one of these down here, each level, I put a little role section at the bottom on who is involved with each section. So when you're creating the product backlog, it's probably your product owner and your stakeholders. When you're doing release planning, it would be your three amigos, which is what this symbol means here, which we'll talk about. And then on level three, when you get to your you know, product backlog refinement, just before you do sprint planning, this is the people that would be involved in, the, in writing the stories and the, and the tests, behavior-driven development tests would be the three amigos and the team. And then when it comes time to do the sprint backlog planning, it's, you know, the team takes it over from there. I also put some samples of how far out you should be planning, right? If this is day one of a sprint, then two to four sprints ahead of time, you would be doing backlog refinements. Three to six sprints out, you'd be doing release planning. And these are just samples. So you can take this and kind of recreate it if you want and add your own time frames. Product backlog refinement would be four months ahead. And then here are some samples of things that you might need to have done at each level. Definitions of ready. Definitions of ready are a way of saying, in order for it to move the neck to the next step, it must meet this definition, right? So this will come with your, uh, the appendix book if, you, if you'd like to get it. All right, so roles. When we're talking about roles, there are really kind of four basic roles on a scrum team. There's the product owner, who's responsible, responsible for maximizing the value of the product. There's the scrum master, who leads and coaches the teams on the agile and behavior-driven development best practices. There's the developers, who write the code. And then there's the testers, who make sure that the um, code meets the requirements 
set down by the user story. So these are the four roles and the four little icons we're going to be using. Now, I mentioned several times here, this concept of a three amigos. And so what the three amigos are, are the three, um, three roles that are responsible for writing behavior driven tests. They are the product owner, the developer, and the tester. And so they are kind of looking at things from three different perspectives, from a quality perspective would be the tester, um, from a business analyst perspective would be the product owners looking out for the business, and then the developer is looking at it from a technical perspective, okay? So when we start talking about behavior-driven development and we start writing behavior-driven tests as actual examples, we want to include all three of these roles at some point on writing those tests. Why do you think we want to have a collaborative effort to write these, to write behavior-driven tests? Why would we want to include three roles instead of just the one role for the product owner like we've done in the past? Right, improve perspective and accuracy covers all the basis points. Yes, you're correct. Now, a lot of people, like the question I get when I train a lot is, boy, now I gotta have these three people writing all these behavior driven tests, all the acceptance criteria, isn't that gonna take a lot of time? And my answer is always twofold. One, they don't have to necessarily do it together. They don't have to sit in a room and do it together, right? The product owner can do it, the developer can look over it, and the tester then can look over it. Um, so that's one answer. The second answer is yes, it takes a lot of time to write the behavior driven tests correctly. But, the whole point of writing them correctly is to make sure that the testers and the team then knows exactly what they are going to be working on in the sprint for a user story so that they can code to it 100% so they know exactly what they're doing. So if you give a, give a development team a half-baked half story with half-baked acceptance criteria, that's exactly what you're gonna get in return. And that's why stories never make it and they fail early on or, 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 or fail is because the requirements and the acceptance criteria were not defined ahead on. So in order to save time in the long run, you might have to spend a little more time up front with the three amigos defining your behavior driven acceptance test. Question, regarding level one product backlog, which is prepared about four months how can how we can make the level one product backlog if we are in the beginning of a project right so if you are in the beginning of a project then your product backlog would you you probably create at the beginning of a project right or it might already be created for you if you went through some sort of um process to define what the project is Lots of organizations go through like a discovery phase where they write some things to get funding for a project and they write high level pieces of functionality that they write, like to see, high level behaviors, that kind of thing. And if um, they've done that, then that is actually your initial product backlog. So yes, it really depends on how your organization works. And your organization may not have all the levels. These are just some examples of some that I've worked with. All right, so here's an example of the way collaboration works amongst the three amigos. The product owner would create the user story component piece of the user story, right? Then they work with the tester to define the Gherkin test. Then the developer may do some design work on the story, and then he might also then create additional tests, right? So this is kind of all working. The, you have a user story. The product owner, tester, and developer create Gherkin tests. Then the developer starts to do design work. And then simultaneously, in the middle of a sprint, once a sprint starts, 
the tester starts working on writing the automated test if you're going to be doing them. The tester then does development work. Then they build the software. We verify that the software worked against the Gherkin test, behavior-driven test, and then we know that we have coverage across the, the feature. So this kind of gives you a wide ranging overview of how you would write a story or how a story life cycle works. Create a user story, define product uh, behavior driven tests, and then so on and so on. All right. The reason we use the three amigos, which we talked about before, is because they have sh different shared experiences, different perspectives uh, of which to base their behavior driven tests on. Now a product owner and a tester work very closely together because a product owner then writes the component number one of a story, the user story themselves. And the tester is primarily then responsible for the Gherkin test, but they work together, right? The tester would have input on the user story and the product owner has input on the Gherkin test. If you're using tools like TFS or JIRA, these things can be built and used inside of the tool. Right? You can create, if you're using the, in, um, in TFS, if you're using test plan, you can create the Gherkin test there and the user story as a user story. And then you can connect them together. And, and JIRA has a, I can't remember what they call it but they do the same thing. So this stuff can be tracked in those tools. Okay. The tester and the developer then work together. The tester takes the Gherkin test and the user story test. The, the developer and the tester work together to automate their each piece and to make sure that each piece then passes. The developer makes sure that their test driven developments test pass and then the tester makes sure that the automated Gherkin test pass. Or if you're not going to automate, you can do these manually. That is fine too, if you don't have the tools. All right, some questions are popping up. Let's see what we have here. What about when designer user interface roles are used? What about becoming the fourth amigo? Yeah, well, in that case, I would consider the user, I would definitely include them in, uh, and you could call it the four amigos if you want, um, but in my mind, then designers are just another form of developer because they're developing some artifacts. So yes, you could call it the four amigos for sure, and but you definitely want to include them also because they have um, knowledge about how the system is going to behave and how people are going to be using it. Perfect, yes. Another question, what if you do not have separate testers, just the developer team and the PO, right? Then you'd have to break it down to the, the two amigos, but um, it might be valid then to, you know, grab a third person on the team to get a third perspective. That way you're still getting three good perspectives. How do you handle if there are no testers on an agile team? Yeah, we just talked about that. Good. All right, good questions. So this is kind of how they, they interact together and then the kind of the order of the flow that they would kind of work on them and when they work on them. Would you bring a customer into the instant apps? If you could bring a customer into any one of these phases, I would definitely do that, especially if you could bring a customer in as a tester, right? Because they're the ones that are actually going to be using the system. So, they're the ones that are you know, going to do the funky stuff that you wouldn't have thought of before. So if you can bring a tester, a customer as a tester, I would say do that for sure. Yeah. And the three amigos is really a concept. So if you need to make it four, five, six amigos, that's fine. Other than just remember that's a lot of people to be coordinating with, but bring all the roles you need in to write good behavior driven examples as acceptance tests. All right, more questions about the, the process on how this works.
Okay. So let's talk real quick about Gherkin, a high level of Gherkin, and then we are going to, I'm going to give you an example of how this works in Cucumber to show you how easy it can be. What would be in the product backlog for high level acceptance criteria? It would just be very high level, right, about what each story is going to achieve at the highest level. So it, um, or the highest level behavior, right? So you may only have one acceptance criteria at the product log level. And then as you move down to level two and three and four, then you would add more and more detailed acceptance criteria, detailed examples on how the system is going to be used. And it would, yes, it would definitely include examples. Always, you always wanna write your acceptance criteria as examples. All right, let's talk about Gherkin real quick. Or not real quick, next. So Gherkin, we've already started to talk about it. Gherkin is a series of keywords. It's a really a kind of a program language that's been written in real English. And they, it's a series of keywords. And we've already talked about the three big ones, the given, which sets up the context, the when, which is the action, and the then, which is the outcome. All BDD examples or acceptance criteria should use these three keywords at a minimum. Now, if you're gonna automate, you might have to use two more, but at a minimum, this, these are the three that you would use. Um, this is a, 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 a copy of that slide we did before so that you could use it for references. Here's another copy of that if you wanted to have more, right? It's the given, sets up the context. The when is the event, and the then is the outcome. Um, so give, looking down here at this, this um, test we have below, we would say given I have $100 in my account, when I request 20, then I should be dispensed 20. Given, when, then. Scenario is a keyword that just sets up a title of what this test is supposed to do. It really doesn't do anything other than gives a definition of what this test is gonna do. Because remember, in each story you'll have multiple tests, so you'll have multiple scenarios, right? This is successful withdrawal from an ATM account. You might have another user story that's the um, non-successful withdrawal from an account. Right, so you might have multiples. This is a way of just telling you what this test is supposed to do. Here are a list of all of the most common keywords. If you ask for the appendix, then I give you some examples on what you do with each one of these. But I'm gonna give you, go through the highest level ones here, a feature keyword defines what a user story, what the user story is. So in this case, a feature is another way of defining the user story. So you def you'd say this is the feature, this is the description of the feature, which can, so I'll show you here as we go. Feature, I def usually write in the user story. The next keyword is scenario, which we talked about, it defines the test. The next word keyword is given, which we've already talked about. It sets up the condition that happened prior to the test starting. We've talked about the when statement. This describes the triggering that's gonna happen. This describes what the actual user will be doing, right? What, what things that they will be doing as they go along. And then the then word describes what the outcome would be, what the user will see. Okay. Those are the basic five keywords, feature, scenario, given, when, and then. Um, a feature can have multiple scenarios. Okay. There are other keywords like and and but that you could put in examples like this one here. 
given I have $100 in my account, but my card is invalid. That's the context we're setting up. When I request 50, then my card should not be returned and I should not be told, I should be told to contact the bank. So you can see here a given and a when have to be out front, given when then have to be the first sentence of a, a test. And you could start with a but or an and, which, which is a way of clarifying the given statement or adding additional criteria to a given statement or a when statement or a then statement. They can be used across all three. You can put comments in your Gherkin statements by starting each line with a hashtag or a pound symbol. Oops. All right. Now we're going to jump over. Any questions about Gherkin so far before I show you how it works? Um, how it works. Right. Can everybody see this um, Eclipse scenario that I've set up my desktop? That says say Package Explorer here. Okay, good. So this is a tool, a development environment that developers use called Eclipse. I should preface now that I am not a developer, so I don't know anything about developing code. I, mean, I know something about databases, but not writing code. Um, I was able to set this environment up all by myself. So it's not that difficult to do. However, if you work in a technical environment, someone can help you with it. Um, and it takes just a little installation to make it work. But this is Cucumber inside of the Eclipse environment. Now, in order to create automate in testing, you need two different types of files. You need a feature file, which would define the test that you want to set up. And you need steps files down here, which are the actual code that will run to test, to make sure that, that um, the tests pass or fail. Okay, so they're pretty simple. And Cucumber works, you'll notice here, here is the feature file for an ATM feature that I'm going to test my ATM feature. You'll notice now I have these three key, the, the five keywords. So it's feature here, scenario, given, when, and then. So the first thing I have to do is define my feature. And I would say, um, as an ATM customer, Oops. All right, so that's the story. The scenario would be test valid pin. And then I say given I am on the um, welcome screen when I enter two, three, four, five, and, and hit press enter, then I should be taken to the screen that has options. Let's do this be taken to the option screen, we'll just call it. So this should look um, familiar to all of you, right? A feature is, is equivalent to the user story. So I would define this as what the user story is. And I'll just put a little note here where you can see that. The scenario here would be the actual acceptance test.
But remember, we're now writing the features in that kind of opposite ma manner that we're describing it as a behavior. So you are correct. This is also a behavior, um, but it's the user story as a behavior. The scenario is the actual test. And then this is the, the testing title. And then this is the actual test. All right. Um, so this is in English, we wrote this. Now you just might say, how do we generate the code that actually runs to validate that the test is going to work or fail? Now to do that, all we have to do is right click on this feature word over here. And we say here, run as, and we say run as configuration. And you'll notice if I've got this working right, when I hit run, okay, it'll run. Okay, what did I do? You shouldn't have to save the file. I did, I'll do it, oops. It should generate the code automatically. What am I doing wrong here? All right, it's working. All right, so you can see here, down here below, it's running a configuration file that runs the scenario that I just ran. See here, it ran it in users. And then it generates the code below right here. See this code that says given, when, you'll notice that this is says Adam, I'm on the welcome screen. It's the same thing here. I'm on the welcome screen. And then it generated a code that says, I enter the username. This is a character symbol that the system already generates. See, it says I enter this. And there are reasons it does this, but we can, that's a more advanced uh, class that we should probably do at stage two for, or another session. But you notice this code is here. And then what you do, there's every Cucumber file has test has two components, a feature file here and a steps file, which is down here, login steps. All you do then is you cut and paste this code here into the test, into the steps file, and now the, step, the test has been created. Now it's up to the developers then to write the, the, the code to make this test pass. Remember we talked about testing first, the test should fail, and then you, um, the developers would work from there. So I entered all of this as a non-developer. I created the initial test here that's going to fail that I would drop into a feature file and then the tester can take over from there, right? So uh, as a non-developer, I created the test. It's pretty simple. Now, it is a, there's another tool that you can use in the background called Selenium which will actually give you the ability to open a web browser and do testing, which I've also taught myself how to use, and it is actually relatively simple. But I'm gonna show you how it also works. I have a login feature here that I've created in the past, and it's, um, let's open it up. So my login feature says I'm going to log into an account with the correct credentials, and I'm really logging into um, my Stack Overflow account. So the given the user navigates to the Stack Overflow website, 
and the user clicks on the login button on the home page, and the user enters a valid username, a password, and then they click on the login button, then the user should be taken to a successful login page. So let's open up a browser real quick, and I'm gonna show you. So what we're saying is we want to open up our screen. The user would open it up and they would start their testing here. And then I'm saying they click on the login screen, right? Then they enter the username, the password. And when they click on login, I change my password. Then they should be taken to, there's a, that's a comma, sorry. Then they should be taken to here. That's what the test is for. So you can see that I generated the code. I dropped it into a steps file, which is all right here. Pretty easy. So if I run this test now, what should happen is, where's my runner here? Watch what happens if it works. It opens a Chrome browser. I'm not doing this, it's happening automatically. It automatically clicks on login and it automatically put my username and password in. Well, I didn't do that part, but so this is what the Selenium part does is it automatically opens it up and it starts to fill in the pieces as I said to do, right? So it's pretty simple to use to, in order to start automating these things. You put in your Gherkin test in your feature files. You right click run a configuration file which generates the code down here, which you drop into a steps file. And then you, then you start using the Selenium code here to run the test, which is also, um, uh, very easy to learn. The second version of this class that we we'll teach, we will spend a lot of time in going over how you write feature files, steps files, and Selenium. So keep an eye out for version two of this class. All right. Questions so far on how that works? Where is it at? Thanks, Mark, for the tip. Sometimes in these things, I get kind of brain dead. All right. And I will include these slides that explain how you make step files and whatnot and some other advanced stuff. Yes, so I have used this for data-driven projects versus front-end projects. And it really, um, the way you use Cucumber, the tool that I was just showing you, it all depends on, there are ways that you can do it, depending on if you're doing data-driven, whether it's an, you're using API, or if you're connecting directly to the database. Remember I told you Selenium is a specific uh, coding library that you can use to test front ends. There are other libraries and things that you can use to test um, data-driven projects also. But really, uh, depending on how the data-driven project works, then you should, is are you I should ask a question Kelly does your project have a front end or is it completely data yeah then you'd have to use a different set of libraries to test that and the developers can can help you with that do that they should know how but yes you definitely can and I do use um, I'm actively working on a project right now where we write cucumber tests to test the front end and we write cucumber tests to test the um, data migration from one database to another. So it is possible, yes. And again, I'm a non-developer and I figured all this stuff out over the last few years. More questions?
All right. So before we end this class today, I'd like to do a couple things. And I would like to give you a user story um, based on that. Uh, let's go back and I want to show you the, um, the ATM thing again. Where is that thing? Bring up the ATM example. So I'm going to use this example here. And if I put in a PIN number and I hit or, or put the PIN number in and I choose English and I am on this screen. So it's checking my pin and I'm on this screen. I'm on the choose an account type screen. Okay. This is where we're going to start. So this is the, the, the starting point. So the story that we're going to write is as a user, I would like to be able to withdraw. $100 from my savings account. And then I just, this is a simple story. Um, write, let's each, let's write a, uh, a BDD acceptance test on how this would work. Right. So what would be a test that the behavior from a developer, if they were going to, how would you test that they're taking $100 out of their savings account? So if you want to do one of those real quick and write it down, remember it needs to be an actual example. All right, they're starting to flow in here. Let's see. Given I'm on the account type screen and I have at least 200 of my savings, when I select an account type of savings and input amount of 100, then the machine will dispense 100. <laughs> okay, input 200, it should dispense 200. Good, Heidi. So this example is good example of a positive test case. And if you went back to the ATM simulator and you actually went through what she says to do, it's, you should be able to follow it step by step. Given I'm on the choose an account type screen, which she says, and I have the 200 in my account, when I select account type of savings, so that's what I'm gonna do, and I input $200, you can do it either way, right, 200. 
Mm. We missed a step. So if I do that, then it should actually come to this screen, not dispense the money. Do you see that? So you probably have to have a, and I chose no receipt or yes receipt, whatever, then hit yes. Then it would dispense the money. So the behavior is pretty close, but not quite right, right? And actually then it asked me to take the card back. So if my test was in order to get the money all the way out, there, we're missing two steps along the way here. But yes, you're, you're closer because you're talking about the actual behavior of what would happen. Good. Did anybody else have one? So I'm hoping that you have gotten a taste of behavior driven development on. Yeah, you're absolutely right. It didn't match the didn't. I hope you're getting a taste of behavior driven development on why you would want to write your acceptance test this way. Now, the one thing that we have not really mentioned is so we if if you wrote a test in behavior driven development and you have a test that says validate the pin number. And then, so that test pass, and then you have another test that's similar to the one that we have here, where you're going to put in $200 to get $200 out. And the, the, um, the, then, the, the given on the one kind of picks up where the end of the last one, the first one left off, we start to stack our behavior driven tests together. So first we would always run the validate test, then we would run the test to, to, to take money out of savings. So by creating these tests as we, and we start to save them in these smaller components, these smaller incremental behaviors, we can create a regression test bed. So now when we go to move code to the environment and we wanna test, we can all go back and test that the validate worked. We can test that the withdrawal worked. We can, do, you know, we can test all of those things over and over and over again. So as we start to add components to our system, we don't need to rewrite the tests over and over for behaviors that we've already tested. We just say, go back and retest the behavior that we already have established. So if you're using TFS or JIRA and you start to create these tests, then you start to string them together to create regression tests. You test the validation, you test the deposit, you deposit with the draw, all of these things. So now we're creating smaller increments of testing as we go. If we find a hole in our testing, all we have to do is create another behavior that works there. We add it to our regression test bed, and then we can test those. So this way, it becomes a living, breathing set of tests that can be used over and over and over in conjunction with each other in any sort of combinations that you need to put them together to get a meaningful test of the user story that you're writing. So let's see what this one says. Um, given I'm on the welcome screen and select savings, when I select $100 and my account bounces 100 and I select no receipt, then I will receive $100 and see, and it be asked, yep, and then you caught your mistake there, I got that. And then given, yep, when I select this at 100, and my account balance is 200, then I have to get $100 US cash from the ATM and my new savings account balance is 100, right. So you're starting to see how these are actual behaviors that your end customer is going to use. Now, if the test should fail, then we go back to the developers and the developers check their, their unit test or their functionality just to figure out why we, things are broken. So to go back to our example where we talked about um, the car, if my, 
my big behavior is I sit down in the car, I turn the key and the ignition starts. If that behavior doesn't work, then the testers go back to their unit test and they say, did the spark plug fire? Did the pistons move? Whatever the tests are that they do and they start to figure out where the um, underlying problem is. But from a user perspective, really all they care about is that the car starts out of that behavior, right? They don't care that the pistons fired and that the spark plug worked. It has to happen, but they don't care. So from testing things at a behavioral driven perspective, we're testing at a higher level at what a customer really would do to use our system. If we have issues, we go downstream to figure those out later. And then we can start to string together those big behaviors to make sure that the system is working at the highest level, right? We might have a behavior of start the car. Then we have one, if we put it in gear, then it should start to move backwards or put it in R, it moves backwards. You put it into F, it moves forwards, right? All of these big behaviors that we test to validate that the little behaviors that the developers wrote actually work. We'll send an email. I will we share this down here for a second. You send an email, we'll send you the quick guide. Um, the slide deck is, is in the chat above. I see Alex posted it. Where did it go? I'll re I'll copy it and I'll post it back in here again. There you go. There's the slide deck if you'd like it in a PDF uh, version. And then uh, keep an eye out on our website and wherever you found this webinar. We'll do some more on Cucumber and Selenium um, and you can get some information on about that. And if not, thank you guys for participating. I know these webinars are hard because there's 30 some people and, and uh, whatnot, but I appreciate you joining me today. Thank you very much.